After years and years of work, Zod 4 Beta has just been announced. Zod is an incredibly popular schema validation library clocking in at 25 million weekly downloads. It's massive in the web development space for making sure your APIs receive the right data, but it's now also getting a second life in the AI space where people are using it to do structured outputs. Zod 3.0 was released on May 2021, and after 24 minor versions, they are finally releasing a major. I've got a playground running locally where we are going to test out all of these nice new features. But first, let's talk about performance. Zod 4 is faster than Zod 3 in all sorts of ways. Their string parsing has got 2.6 times faster. Their array parsing has got 3 times faster. Their object parsing has gone 7 times faster running the multi-validation library benchmark. Another massive deal is that the TypeScript performance of Zod has really taken a leap up. This has been a big criticism of libraries like Zod and TRPC is that they are kind of slow and clunky to run on TypeScript. Not necessarily when you start out, but when you start using them in a big monorepo or a large code base. Particular features like extend really, really hammer the TypeScript compiler in version 3. This results in 25,000 type instantiations, but in Zod 4, it only results in about 1,000. And for clarity, counting the number of type instantiations is a pretty good metric for understanding how performant your TypeScript code is. And when we talk about type performance, we're talking about the speed of your editor, the speed of your type check, all that stuff. So this means that code bases that use Zod are going to get a vastly improved TypeScript performance. And when you combine that with the upcoming TSGO compiler, Zod's 4 editor performance will scale to vastly larger schemas and code bases. Yeah, that rings true. It's not just performance, though. We're also seeing a massive reduction in bundle size. Let's say we take this pretty simple script just here. In Zod 3, that would be 12.5 kilobytes gzipped. In Zod 4, that is only 5.36 kilobytes. So that is pretty nice, 57% smaller. But bundle size really only matters matters when you're talking about the front end, where you want your bundle to be as small as possible. I've never really considered Zod as a really great choice in like bundle constricted environments because it's just slightly too big and it does slightly too much for what you need on the front end. But introducing Zod Mini. That's right, Zod Mini is a sister library with a functional tree shakeable API. And where Zod generally uses methods which are harder to tree shake, Zod Mini uses wrapper functions. We are inside our REPL here. This thing will go red if we get an error. We can see that we're importing star as Z from Zod Mini, and it means we get this z.optional z.string. If we change this to a number here and save the file, you see we get an error. That's because foo is not a number, but if we change this to undefined, then it should work. Let's use a different example where we want to check if this string has a minimum length. Unlike normal Zod, we can't do z.string.min5, for instance, because we're getting an error saying string.min is not a function. Instead, we can pass a check function, and then inside the check function, pass z.minLength5. And now we're getting an error on the REPL until we actually pass the check. You can also pass multiple functions into check to make sure that if we go too crazy here, that we'll get an error from the max length instead. This feels really similar to valid in its API, and that does make sense because these guys have been collaborating on things like standard schema. Having a tree shakeable Zod is so good for the front end. If we go back to our example before, then we see that using Zod Mini actually ends up in a massive reduction in bundle size, from 12.5 kilobytes down to under 2 kilobytes. And there's a huge list here of all of the different exports that come from Zod Mini. We can see z.nonpositive, z.min length, includes, uppercase, lowercase, mime, normalized, trim, all this stuff. The next thing that really gets me excited is JSON schema conversion. JSON schema is used a lot in AI for structured outputs and tool calling. We're now creating a my schema using z.object here with name and points, and then creating a JSON schema from it using z.toJSON schema passing in our schema. We can see then that the JSON schema looks perfect here, where we have name and points, and they're both required, and we have type of object down the bottom. If we remove name and save the file, then we're going to see that only point remains. There was a library you could use before to basically get this behavior, but it's so nice to have it first class. Zod4 introduces a new system for adding strongly typed metadata to your schemas. It's not stored inside the schema itself. Instead, it's stored in a schema registry. In other words, this registry here accepts title string and description string. You can then add your schema to the registry and then add the information for the registry along with it. There is also a global registry that accepts 
some common JSON schema compatible definitions like ID and description. I'm actually unsure why this change was made. I assume to decouple something about the metadata from the schemas themselves and put them in a registry instead. An interesting outcome from this is that dot describe still works, but it's no longer really recommended. Instead, you would use dot meta and pass a description field. Yeah, I'm not sure what the gain is here, really. If someone knows in the comments, then I'll happily pin it. Zod also brings Z dot interface, which is a new API for defining object types. Please no, please don't tell me that there's objects and interfaces in Zod as well as freaking TypeScript. It appears that the reason for this is exact uh, optional properties. You have two types of optionality here. You have key options optional where the optionality is on the key itself and value optional, where you have to pass the value, but it can be string or undefined. Zod3, it turns out, cannot represent value optional. So it appears that z.interface allows you, instead of just doing z, so it appears that zod, so it appears that z.interface allows you to specify the optionality on the key itself. So the difference here is this top one will be required, so it's value optional, but this one, the key is not required, so it's key optional. So funnily enough, z.interface was added, it appears only to support this change. They are functionally identical otherwise. I suppose this probably also supports exact optional property types quite well. To explain that, if we imagine we have a user defaults object with a color theme override option, there are only three possible values. Either you omit the key completely or you specify dark or light. If you turn on this setting called exact optional property types, then you'll get an error here if you explicitly set it to undefined. I have to say I've never really seen the point of this, so maybe the z.interface API is not particularly for me. But okay, I've read on a little bit and there is more to z.interface. z.interface allows you to do true recursive types. In Zod3, you would have to do a pretty nasty maneuver if you wanted recursive types. Here we have a category schema, which then in the subcategories has an array of itself. You would have to create a type, then use z.lazy and then annotate the type manually. I have actually run into this before and it is nasty. But in Zod4, you can use a getter here saying get subcategories and return z dot array category. So no need to declare an actual extra type here, it just automatically infers from this behavior. This is a vast improvement and yeah, maybe I would end up using z.interface after all. Next one, an easy win, Zod can now validate file instances using z.file. Minimum size, maximum size, and mime type. Incredible. Very, very useful if you're doing any kind of form data or receiving files for upload, all that stuff. Zod4 introduces a new locales API for globally translating error messages into different languages. Currently only the English locale is available, but I imagine this kind of thing will be iterated on, you know, once it's past beta. Zod4 brings error pretty printing. Oh, nice. Zod now implements a top level z.prettify error function. So if you get this kind of horrible error of unrecognized keys, invalid type, number too small, and you call z.prettify error, you get a really gorgeous, pretty printable multi line string. I mean, that's really, really nice, not only for API endpoints, maybe even for the front end when you're using this. Very cool. Zod's done some messing about here to move all string formats like email and IPs and URLs, base URLs, JWTs, etc. They're all now going to live on the top level of the module. This means that they are much more tree shakeable. The method equivalents like z.string email are still available, but have been deprecated, planning to be removed in the next major version. Sometimes packages use major versions to deprecate things which they're then planning to remove in the next version. This means that Zod5 will probably get an even smaller bundle size by moving all of these to the top level. You can now customize the email regex in z.email. You can use the classic one proposed in RFC 5322. You can use the one used to validate input type email fields, or you can use a loose regex that allows you to use Unicode. Zod4 implements z.template literal. This allows you to convert one-to-one -one from Zod into TypeScript template literal types. For instance, this type represents any string that has hello comma space at the start. In this example, we have CSS units where we have a union between four different strings. We can pass that union into z.template literal here and add a number before it. So we end up with number, px, number, em, 
number rem and number percentage. Next up, let's talk about z.stringbool. There's an existing API for this called z.coerce boolean. It works by using the underlying JavaScript truthiness of something to work out whether it should be a boolean or not. But what if you want to do something more complex where you want, let's say, the string y to be true and the string n to be false? This is important for things like query parameters or environment variables. Well, Zod4 introduces z.stringbool, where you can pass in true here or return true, pass in yes, on, y, enable. But crucially, you can pass in values that resolve to truthiness in JavaScript and they will resolve to false using string bool. So the truthy value of the string false will result in false. So zero, no, off, n, disabled, fantastic. And you can even customize the truthy values. It also looks like anything outside of this list, so anything outside what these 12 values will result in an invalid value. So it's almost like there's an internal enum for the truthy ones, an internal enum for the falsy ones, and you get to customize what those enums are. Okay, I've got a meeting coming up in 15 minutes, so I have to stop there, but oh my god, there is so much more even in the post. I will link to it below. You can check it out. Zod4 is coming. Yeah. The only downside for me is, of course, I have a Zod tutorial, which is free and, you know, you can watch it now and get an idea of Zod. But I'm going to have to bloody update the thing, aren't I? Honestly, these library authors, how dare they change the underlying code to make all our lives better? So inconvenient. And if you know what that's a reference to, uh, well done, you spend too much time on Twitter. And if you want to know what I'm working on right now, well, I'm working on AI Hero. I have a massive course coming out implementing a really complicated AI system in TypeScript. It is going to be in incredible and I cannot wait to show you. All right, folks, that is enough from me. I will see you very soon.